It was a cold, miserable September in 1837 for the residents of London. The Industrial Revolution had led to a rapid increase in the size of England's capital city. As a result of people and villages moving to cities to try and find work, alongside immigrants from all over the world. London was known as the biggest, most spectacular city in Europe that was filled with countless opportunities. As many industries' profits soared with the new machinery that could do the work of several people. However, the machinery meant that employers needed fewer workers, and the demand for jobs was higher than was available. Those that did find work found that the wages were barely enough to sustain themselves and their families, yet people still flocked to the city to try for a better life. Overcrowding, poor sanitation, and extreme poverty were plaguing London. It was here that the rumor of a ghostly figure really took hold. With clawed hands, spring shoes, and the rumored ability to breathe fire, this mysterious being had people in London terrified to leave their homes after dark. This is the story of Spring-Heeled Jack. Five miles to the southwest of the crowded capital city center, in the village of Barnes, a rumor was beginning to spread. Villagers were talking about a ghost that had been attacking people around the area throughout September, with women being the more common target. According to these rumors, the ghost was shaped like a white bull. This ghost soon traveled to a neighboring town called East Sheen, although the people there claimed it had taken the form of a white bear instead of a bull. The alleged attacks continued, with the appearance of the ghost changing once more as it came closer to the city center. Witnesses in Hampton, nine miles away from Barnes, claimed that this mysterious ghost was an unearthly warrior that was wearing polished brass armor, clawed gloves, and spring shoes. Although he wasn't known by this nickname until 1838, Spring-Heeled Jack continued to terrify people as reports of attacks started to increase. In late 1837, a carpenter called Jones was attacked by a ghost in armor on Cutthroat Lane in London. According to rumors, Jones fought back, but two more ghosts appeared and the man was severely injured. As more people began to hear about this creature, fake stories began to spread, including a supposed attack on a vendor and a woman being frightened to death at the thought of meeting him. Both stories were later discredited. According to the newspaper The Morning Chronicle, on December 28, 1837, quote, Some scoundrel, disguised in a bearskin and wearing spring shoes, has been seen jumping to and fro before foot passengers in the neighborhood of Lewisham, and has in one or two instances greatly alarmed females. The newspaper also stated that people were referring to the attacker as Steel Jack. Despite all of these alleged attacks, it wasn't until the 9th of January, 1838, that the press became particularly interested in the story. That was when the Lord Mayor of the City of London, Sir John Cowan, announced that he had received an anonymous letter about this supernatural being and the attacks in the area. According to the newspaper The Times, Cowan was unwilling to do anything to stop the attacks due to the fact that they were not in his jurisdiction. He concluded that the letter was written by a woman who had lost her senses as a result of the rumors. Although the mayor had dismissed the letter, the announcement sparked a wave of articles from several local newspapers, with even the more reputable papers such as the Times reporting alleged sightings as news rather than gossip. The press would have pages dedicated to Spring-Heeled Jack, which only increased the overall paranoia of the residents of London and its outskirts. According to the Times, in January of 1838, servant girls reported that a blacksmith had had his flesh and clothes torn by a ghost with iron claws, and rumors of women having their clothes torn off and having violent fits began to be reported in several newspapers. The Morning Chronicle on the 11th of January found that Mayor Cowan had received another anonymous letter which stated that this culprit had frightened several people in Stockwell, Brixton, Camberwell, and Vauxhall, all areas around the capital city, and claimed that some of the victims had apparently died of fright. 
By the 20th of January, rumors and misinformation continued to be spread by the daily newspapers. According to The Sun, there were no ghosts, but instead the attacks were done by a group of children that were connected to important families in the area. The newspaper claimed that 5,000 pounds, a huge 500,000 pounds in today's money, were at stake depending on how successful the group was, and that their objective was to, quote, destroy the lives of not less than 30 human beings. However, no other newspaper reported on this theory, and it is difficult to know where The Sun got this information from, but it shows how the information in the newspapers being reported at the time ranged from troubling to outright bizarre. The 20th of January was also an important date for the mythology of this mysterious being. In the Penny Satirist, a local newspaper, it was the first time the name Springheeled Jack was used by the press in connection with this ghost. Almost immediately, other newspapers began to use this name to describe the attacker, with large headlines mentioning the name to help boost their sales. Jane Alsop was an 18-year-old woman that came from a wealthy family. Some reports state that she lived with her parents, whereas others say it was only her father. What is publicly known, however, is that she had two sisters, Mary Alsop and Susan Harrison, as well as one brother. On the 19th of February, 1838, at around 8.45 p.m., Jane heard a loud knocking at the door and went to answer it. There was a man standing outside who claimed to be a police officer. When Jane asked what was wrong, he replied, quote, For heaven's sake, bring me a light, for we have caught Spring-Heeled Jack here in the lane. She went back into the house to grab a candle for the officer, which she handed over. As soon as he grabbed the candle, he threw off his cloak and put the candle to his chest, revealing a monstrous appearance. The stranger spat a blue and white flame from his mouth, and his eyes were described as resembling red balls of fire. Despite her fear, Jane noted that he wore a large helmet and clothing that appeared to be a white oil skin. The attacker grabbed the back of her neck before tearing her gown with metallic claws. She screamed and tried to run away, but the man grabbed her once more and tore at her neck and arms with his claws. Jane was rescued by one of her sisters, and the attacker fled. Due to the violent attack, Jane suffered multiple cuts and injuries, including on her neck, shoulders, and arms. When a police officer arrived, Jane described the incident in detail, with her story being confirmed by other members of the household. Her sister, Susan, stated that Jane's dress, quote, was nearly torn off her, both her combs dragged out of her head, as well as a quantity of her hair torn away. Mr. Alsop, Jane's father, also said that he believed that there was more than one person connected to the crime, due to the fact that the attacker never returned for his cloak and therefore someone else must have been there with him to pick it up. As a result of this attack, there was a huge amount of publicity, and with it came people offering financial rewards. Mr. Alsop offered 10 guineas, approximately a thousand pounds in today's money, and Sir Edward Codrington, a member of Parliament, offered a further five pounds, around 500 pounds today. This was also the first time that police really took an attack allegedly committed by Springheeled Jack seriously. There were two separate investigations into the Jane Alsop attack. One investigation was headed by two members of the Stepney-based police, Superintendent Young and the Inspector Guard. The second investigation was headed by Detective James Leia, who was employed by the Lambeth Street Police Office and was reportedly considered the best detective in London at the time. Leia reported his findings to the magistrate judge on the 22nd of February, stating that he believed that the attacker had been in the neighborhood for close to a month before the attack and had almost been caught at least once. Detective Leia went on to say, quote, A person, answering precisely his size and figure, had been frequently observed walking around the lanes and lonely places, enveloped in a large Spanish cloak, and sometimes in the habit of carrying a small lantern about him. 
All three of the investigators agreed that Jane Alsop had certainly been attacked, but that the shock and fear had caused her to mistakenly describe the appearance of her attacker. They concluded that it was nothing more than a drunken frolic, quote unquote, that had nothing to do with Springheeled Jack, and that the white oil skin and helmet was merely a white shooting coat and a cap with a peak at the front. These conclusions, that it was a human male instead of a supernatural devil-like creature, did nothing to stop the widespread fear around the capital, and reported sightings and rumors of people having violent fits continued. However, on March 4, 1838, the Examiner newspaper reported that two men had been questioned for several hours at the Lambeth Street Police Station. According to the newspaper, on the 28th of February, the officers made their case to three magistrate judges and a large crowd of people. The two arrested men were called Payne, no reported first name, who was a local bricklayer, and Thomas Milbank, a local carpenter. The police officers had found several witnesses who had been on Bearbinder Lane, where the Alsops lived, at the time of the assault, and they were called to give evidence alongside Jane Alsop and her family. The testimony of James Smith, a coach wheelwright, was seen as particularly important. According to Smith, he had been walking down Bearbinder Lane when he heard screams coming from the Alsop residence. He ran to see what had happened when he saw Payne and Thomas Milbank walking away from the house. Milbank was allegedly wearing a white hat and a shooting jacket, which Detective Leia believed was the white oilskin that Jane Alsop had described. Furthermore, Smith claimed that he saw the two men later on in the evening. They noticed him, and Milbank grabbed the wheel that Smith was holding while saying, What have you to say, Spring Jack? Smith stated that he asked the man to leave his wheel alone before quickly heading into the nearest pub, the Morgan's Arms, but Milbank and Payne followed him in and went upstairs. Smith asked the landlord who the man in the shooting jacket was and was told that the man was called Thomas Milbank. When questioned about James Smith's testimony, both Payne and Milbank denied attacking Jane Alsop and having the conversation with Smith although Milbank admitted that he'd been so drunk that evening that he had no memories of that night. When asked, Jane Alsop and her sisters were adamant that the attacker was not drunk. After hearing the evidence, the magistrate judges concluded that Milbank seemed likely, but that further investigation was needed. The results of this new investigation were heard less than a week later, on the 2nd of March. However, the testimony did nothing but confuse matters further. According to a new witness, a shoemaker called Richardson, who had been on Bearbinder Lane at the time of the attack and had seen both Milbank and Payne, had also seen who he thought were the two real suspects, a boy and a young man wearing a large cloak. According to Richardson, the young man said something about spring Jack being on the lane, which he apparently said in a joking manner. This was considered suspicious by the police because they claimed that only Jane Alsop knew that the attacker had identified himself as spring Jack, despite the fact that this had also been reported in newspapers. More investigations were requested, but it was never reported in the newspapers if anything else of note was found. The mysterious young man in the large cloak was never conclusively identified, and despite the brutal attack, no one ever stood trial for the attack on Jane Alsop. Despite the increased publicity and police presence, the mysterious figure known as spring Jack continued with his attacks. Less than a week after the assault on Jane Alsop, on the 25th of February, Jack allegedly knocked on the door of 2 Turner Street, not too far away from Bearbinder Lane. Mr. Ashworth was the owner of the house, and his servant answered the door. Like with Jane, the man pulled away a large cloak and revealed what was described as, quote, a most hideous appearance. The servant screamed, and Jack then ran away. The servant did note that there was an embroidered coat of arms with a W on the cloak, but it is unclear if the police did anything with this information. Just days later, on the 28th of February, 18-year-old Lacey Scales was attacked. Lacey was the daughter of a butcher and had two siblings, a brother and a sister. 
According to her testimony, she and her sister left their brother's house on Narrow Street to return to their home on the nearby Weeks Place. To reach their residence, they walked down an alleyway and saw a person standing in the passageway wearing a large cloak. As Lacey got closer to the stranger, he spurted out a bright flame in her face that temporarily blinded her. She immediately dropped to the ground and had a violent seizure, which reportedly lasted several hours. Lucy stated that she had originally assumed that the stranger was a woman because it appeared as though they were wearing a bonnet, but up close she realized that it was a tall and thin man. Her brother had heard his sister's screams, but by the time he found them, Lucy was already on the ground and the attacker had run away. This information was presented in front of the magistrates. Lucy Scales explained that her sister would be able to describe the attacker in a more detailed way. But, strangely, her sister had been unavailable when the police officer had called, and so her brother provided her account in her place. According to Mr. Scales, Lucy's sister had also described the attacker as tall and thin, and that he had a, quote, gentlemanly appearance. He was carrying a small lamp with him, and had cast aside his cloak when Lucy had approached him. She also saw blue flames appear from his mouth and had been blinded by the light but she covered her eyes and ran towards her sister. By the time she'd reached Lucy, the attacker had fled without saying a word. Unlike with Jane Alsop, there was very little interest from the newspapers to report this case. According to Carl Bell, in his 2012 book The Legend of spring Jack, this was likely because Lucy Scales' background was considerably poorer than Jane Alsop's and, therefore, her story would have been considered less reliable and less interesting to the press. Despite the lack of public outrage, the attack was still investigated by Detective James Leia, and he visited the alleyway where the attack took place. He commented that it was the ideal spot to be able to observe anyone that was approaching. Detective Leia reportedly also watched an experiment at the London Hospital that helped to show that the blue flames weren't proof of a supernatural being but rather a man simply able to create fire. As a result of the experiment, they concluded that Jack was able to create fireballs by, quote, blowing through a tube in which spirits of wine, sulfur, and another ingredient were deposited and ignited. Other investigators also questioned people that worked in theater, including the proprietor of the Pavilion Theater, Mr. Farrell. Mr. Farrell spoke as a witness at Lambeth Street Police Station and stated, Quote, that the dropping of certain strong acids on a sponge charged with spirits of wine could produce such appearances as those described, and that the color of the flame emitted would depend on the peculiar quality or description of acid. The police were confident that they'd been able to prove how the flames were created, due to the attacks on Jane and Lucy having both involved blue flames. Chief Magistrate Hardwick concluded that they were attacked by the same man. They just did not know who this attacker was. In addition to having no real leads, the police had another issue on their hands. Copycats. According to the Morning Herald, on the 2nd of March, a man entered the White Lion Pub on Ver Street. There, he told the landlady that he was spring Jack, and attempted to hit her with a club. Thankfully, he missed and was quickly apprehended. In another incident in March, Charles Grenville was charged with frightening a number of women and children. Described as being tall and thin, he donned a blue mask with bright lips and pretended to attack strangers. When caught, Grenville stated that it had merely been a bit of fun. Luckily for him, the judge agreed and the case was dismissed and he was let off with a warning to not do it again. A third copycat attack happened on March 31st, at around 8pm. Mrs. Amsink, who was described in the papers as, quote, a most respectable married lady, unquote, was walking with a friend when she was grabbed by a ghostly figure wearing a white sheet and a monstrous mask with a long beard attached. However, both women recognized the voice as the footman of a nearby house, named James Painter. When they fought back, Painter fled, but the women caught up to him. He was later fined four pounds. 
Due to the copycats and false information, it was difficult to know which, if any, attacks were actually perpetrated by Spring-Heeled Jack. It appeared as though he had traveled away from the capital by April of 1838. However, as the Times reported that a gardener in Sussex, around 70 miles away from London, had been attacked by a ghostly bear. This bear had chased the man before eventually scaling a wall and disappearing. The Brighton Gazette reported on this incident as well, directly naming the perpetrator as spring Jack. The Leeds Mercury newspaper also reported that spring Jack was seen on the 19th of May in Whitby, on the northeast coast of England, over 250 miles away from London. Like in Sussex, he was seen in a ghostly, bestial form. After 1838, public interest in the mysterious figure seemed to wane and newspapers were also losing interest. spring Jack was seen in various places around the country over the years, but these were often passed around through word of mouth and very rarely reported in the press. In September of 1845, such rumors of seeing Jack in Great Yarmouth, Norfolk, led to a brutal assault due to mistaken identity. According to reports, 50-year-old Thomas Purdy, who was suffering from pleurisy, a condition where the membrane in the lungs becomes inflamed, stumbled out of his house in a delirious state and frightened a passing neighbor. A man by the name of Henry Noble heard the neighbor's screams and ran to assist, and he later claimed that he assumed it was spring Jack trying to attack her. Noble violently attacked Purdy, and the man later died. Luckily for Noble, the coroner concluded that Purdy died of natural causes and therefore he was not charged with murder. Another death has been attributed to spring Jack, only this one was a murder. According to the urban legend, on the 12th of November 1845 in London, a young prostitute called Maria Davis was attacked by Jack and thrown off of a bridge where she drowned in the mud. However, this murder was not reported in any newspapers at the time, and modern researchers have never found any evidence of this actually occurring. There's no contemporary documents, such as coroner reports or police records or anything like that. Experts on the history of spring Jack have concluded that it is likely that this attack was nothing more than a myth. The rumors surrounding Jack continued well into the 1870s, including one where a ghostly figure was scaring soldiers at a British army camp in Aldershot, Hampshire in 1877. The local newspaper Sheldrake's Aldershot and Sandhurst Military Gazette covered the incident on March 17th of that year. According to the report, a sentry on night duty saw a figure come towards him. When he asked who they were, the figure did not answer and instead moved around the sentry box at an unnatural speed. The sentry shot at the figure with his rifle, but it had no effect and the figure later ran away. A similar incident occurred with another sentry on duty, who also fired at the mysterious figure but apparently missed. According to the newspaper, the men around the camp had already concluded that this mysterious figure was indeed spring Jack. A month after the original incident, it was reported that spring Jack had returned and had been, quote, kind enough to inform a gentleman the other night that his object is to frighten the British army. Furthermore, the Times in April reported that Jack had slapped a sentry on the face several times before running away then wrestled with another sentry, and narrowly escaped apprehension when a group tried to hunt him down. Jack seemed to disappear from the camp at the end of April, 1877, but appeared briefly again over the summer, where he continued to frighten sentries and avoid capture. After that, there was no evidence or reports that he ever returned to the area. spring Jack's last ever public appearance was in Liverpool in 1904, According to reports, spring Jack leapt from building to building in front of hundreds of onlookers before disappearing. Despite this being accepted as Jack's last ever appearance, another explanation for this event in Liverpool was discovered over six decades later. Mrs. Pierpoint, who had been a young child in 1904, said that it wasn't spring Jack, but, quote, a local man slightly off balance mentally. He had a form of religious mania, and he would climb onto rooftops of houses crying out, My wife is the devil. 
they usually fetched police or a fire engine ladder to get him down. As the police closed in on him, he would leap from one house roof to the next. That's what gave rise to the Spring-Heeled Jack rumors. Whether it was Spring-Heeled Jack or his name was simply attached to this figure due to local folklore, the mysterious being was never seen again. There have been a few theories about who Spring-Heeled Jack could be over the years. A popular theory at the time was that he really was a ghost or devilish figure, and a more modern theory is that he was an alien creature that came to Earth to terrorize people. Other theorists prefer a more human explanation, that Spring-Heeled Jack was a man, or perhaps even several men over the years who used theatrics and or science to frighten or hurt people. The Marquis of Waterford, Henry Beresford, has been considered a suspect since the 1830s. He was infamous around London for his vandalism, his misogyny, and using violence for his own amusement. It was also noted that he loved pranks and would do anything for bet. This behavior led to him getting the nickname the Mad Marquis. Although he was a popular suspect, there is no hard evidence to suggest that he was Spring-Heeled Jack. There was the embroidered coat of arms with a W on his back seen by the servant during the Ashworth incident, and he lived in London at the time of the attacks. But the Marquis of Waterford was never charged. Furthermore, he left London to live in Ireland in 1842, so if he was Spring-Heeled Jack, at least the original, then he wouldn't have been the only one. Thirty years after the pranks at the Aldershot army camp, it was revealed by Colonel Alfred Welby that the people in the camp had their suspicions about who the prankster was. They believed that it was Lieutenant Henry Alfrey of the 60th Rifles, who was described as, quote, a very big and powerful man but extraordinarily active. However, Alfrey never confessed to being Spring-Heeled Jack, and he was never charged with any crime. The legend of Spring-Heeled Jack has changed considerably over the years, from changing forms between a bear and a man, to changing his way of acting from tearing at people's clothes to frightening soldiers. It is impossible to know what really happened and what were just rumors that snowballed into people accepting them as true, and then what were outright fabrications. What is known, however, is that Spring-Heeled Jack captivated the imaginations of countless people across multiple generations, with people passing down his stories to their children and them passing it down even further. He was used as a boogeyman to frighten children into being good, and although Spring-Heeled Jack is no longer a household name, his story is still being told in books and in online discussion threads to this day, with many people still showing interest in the mystery. It is very unlikely that the identity of Spring-Heeled Jack will ever be definitively proven. Too much time has passed, and the line between fact and fiction in this case has been blurred. Because of this, the legend of Spring-Heeled Jack remains unresolved. Thank you for listening to this episode of Unresolved. I have been your host, Michael Whelan. While I normally research and write each episode, this episode was actually written by someone else, new Unresolved contributor Gabriella Bromley. 
I thought she did an outstanding job with this story, and I hope that she'll continue working with me on more awesome episodes in the near future. The music you're listening to right now is the Unresolved theme song, written and composed by Ailsa Traves. The rest of the music in this episode was composed by myself through Amper Music. To learn more about the show, you can head to the podcast website at unresolved.me. There, you can find all of the relevant podcast information you might need. Transcripts of each episode, a list of sources for each story, links to the social media pages, an email contact form, etc. If you would like to support this show, you can click on the store tab at the top of the page to buy some unresolved merch. Or you can click on the Patreon tab to be redirected to the Unresolved Patreon. There you can get access to stuff like bonus episodes, the exclusive Patreon-only show Resolved, and some other stuff like Unresolved stickers or coasters or magnets. Once again, you could find that by clicking on the Patreon tab at the top of the website, or by heading directly to patreon.com slash unresolvedpod. Before I go, I would like to thank the producers of Unresolved, who support this show each month through Patreon. These producers are Maggie James, Ben Crocom, Roberta Jansen, Matthew Brock, Quill Carter, Peggy Ballarda, Evan White, Laura Hannon, Catherine Vatalaro, Damian Moore, Amy Hampton Miller, Scott Meesey, Stephen Wilson, Scott Patzold, Marie Vangland, Lori Rodriguez, Emily McMeehan, Jessica Yount, Amy McGregor, Lauren Harris, Danny Williams, Cody Ketterling, Brian Rollins, Sue Kirk, Sarah Mascaratolo, and Thomas Ahern. For everyone else, thank you for listening, and make sure to keep spreading the good word of Unresolved to anyone that might be interested in listening. I thought this story might make a fun little October-themed Halloween episode, and I know I'm a couple weeks early, but hope you all have a happy Halloween. Until next time, stay safe, and I will talk to you later.